Good morning, everyone. This is a joint meeting of the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee. We're delighted to have our senators here as well. And we are going to be hearing today about the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. <clears throat> Excuse me, many of you know uh, about this initiative and how incredibly important it's been uh, to our rural economy for the last several years. And uh, this is a, our yearly meeting to get our updates. And um, so, Bobby, is there anything you want to say just very briefly? And we'll turn it over to Anson. Um, well, the only thing is that, um, you know, we know that Working Lands, uh, the Enterprise Initiative has really worked well. Uh, we've added, uh, of course, more money to the program, and hopefully uh, it'll help a lot of our, our enterprises uh, in agriculture pr uh, proceed in, in a good manner over the next year. Um, so, and we're just starting to work on the 23 budget, and uh, hopefully uh, that will bear some fruit uh, and some money for for next year. So um, I want to thank, uh, you know, all the people that uh, that work on that, as well as the ones that have applied and not received. Well, keep on working on your app and maybe we'll get you the next trip around. So with that, uh, thank you, Carolyn. Well, thank you, Bobby. And, <clears throat> and now it's my real pleasure and I, and I want to thank everyone in advance for your time today. We really appreciate you being here. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Agriculture, Food and Markets, Anson Tebbets. So Anson, welcome. Well, thank you. And thank you all uh, members of the legislature and our partners across uh, state government and board members. On uh, behalf of uh, Deputy Eastman, we're delighted to be here to talk about uh, this program. This uh, program uh, supports farm and forest uh, economies. Um, the Working Lands Program began a decade ago. Um, it's a partnership uh, that brings together those who are making a living off the land, as well as uh, partners, including the Agency of Agriculture, uh, Forest Parks and Recreation, and the Agency of Commerce mm -hmm. and Community Development. Uh, the board leads the program. Uh, this board reviews and vets the uh, grant applications and after some uh, difficult choices awards dollars um, and those dollars grow the rural economy uh, and make those businesses uh, more affordable. In a few minutes, you'll hear from a number of folks uh, about uh, the advances we've made Uh-oh, <laughs> where'd he go? Anson needs better broadband. Yeah. <laughs> Anson, if you can hear me, you're frozen. We'll you're always me. a living habit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Anson, maybe you could turn off your video if you can hear me. When he's frozen like that, he usually has to rejoin the meeting. Okay. Yeah, he should be on shortly. Happens quite often. <laughs> yeah. So, Allison, do you think we should turn this to, over to uh, Lynn Allen? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, so, our first witness and is, uh, wait a minute, maybe he'll be back, is Lynn Ellen Sh um, um, Schmoller. And um, Lynn, Lynn Ellen, do you want to pick up from... <clears throat> where Anson left off. Maybe we could have an all mute for everybody else. Am I back? Oh, there you are. Okay, yeah, we're back. I was just turning it over to Lynn Allen, but you made it just in time. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off my video. That may help, okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're, it's off. If we can hear okay. you, your video is off. It's good. Okay. Um, so as I was, I was, I was talking, uh, the governor has proposed uh, doubling the annual appropriation for working lands. Um, that's proven that this is a, a worthwhile investment. Allocating more dollars to working lands was one of the priorities of the governor's commission on the future of agriculture. That report is just out. And we hope you agree that allocating uh, more dollars to this program is needed. 
This administration is focused on making investments that transform our economy and working lands uh, does that. The pandemic has exposed the uh, country's food system uh, and it's very fragile at this time. And we cannot depend on faraway places to feed all of us. All the proposals at hand help hardworking Vermonters uh, by making it more affordable to access the food we need to live, work, eat, and play uh, in the Green Mountain State. Vermont's story is strong, uh, but it needs some support. And now is the time to capitalize and transform agriculture and the forest yeah. sector. Investing in agriculture and forestry improves the economy of rural Vermont, uh, makes our state more livable, and provides nutritious food for all Vermonters. I would like to thank uh, Deputy Allison Eastman, who helps lead this board, as well as Lynn Ellen Schmoller, who manages this program. Lynn Ellen runs a smooth, efficient program that makes a difference uh, for countless Vermonters and uh, their companies. I want to introduce some of the speakers that you're going to hear from. Uh, we're going to hear from Lynn Allen. We're also going to hear another tremendous partner that's been with us uh, for a number of years, and that's Molly Mahar, who's the president of the Vermont Ski Association. Uh, we're here from uh, Charlie Hancock, who's a consulting forester uh, with Northwoods Forestry. We'll hear from uh, the Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation and Danielle Fitzo. Randall Zott with the Agency of Community uh, Development and Commerce is with us. Another partner is Ellen Kaler with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Gus Selig, uh, the Executive Director of Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Sarah mm -hmm. Eich, another partner with uh, Vita is with us. Steve Bick. Um, of Northeast Forest, Joe Bossen of Vermont Bean Crafters and Vermont All Souls uh, Tortilla. Uh, they're all with us today. And we also have a number of board members that are with us. And if it's appropriate, Madam Chair, um, it would be appropriate if maybe some of the board members could say hi, maybe turn their cameras on and just say hi to everybody to know that and we appreciate the, the, the long hours they put in vetting these proposals, <laughs> guiding us through that. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, those members, if they want to say hi, and then Lynn Ellen Schmoller is going to run through some of the talking points and some of the um, investments we've made over the last few years. Sure, go ahead, board members. Yeah. Quick Lynn Ellen, like to call on people so they know who's going and we are, aren't all interrupting at the same time. That would be good. Happy to. David Hubbard. This is David Hubbard. With, I work with uh, GMC Hardwoods. I live in Norwich, Vermont. Allison Lowe. Hi, I'm, I'm Allison Lowe. I work with Northeastern Vermont Development Association with a regional planning commission and the Economic Development Corporation for the Northeast Kingdom. And I joined the board just last year. Donna Young. I'm Donna Young, a sugar maker from Morgan, Vermont, and I just recently joined the board to represent Maple. Paul Frederick, designee to Commissioner Mike Snyder. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Frederick. I'm the Forest Economy Program Manager for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And unfortunately, I... <laughs> Get my video on. Well, don't worry, Paul. We're glad you're here. Are there any other board members? I think at this point, Madam Chair, that's it, except for the board members who will be speakers. Okay, I really want to thank you, board members, for the time you put in. Um, really, really <laughs> appreciate your work. It's a very successful program, and um, and it's it's just stellar in terms of everything we are looking forward to in, in terms of the future and making uh, our forestry and agriculture sectors more um, successful. So um, with that, Anson, and, uh, we'll turn it to Lynn Ellen Sch Schmoller, is that correct? Great, go ahead, Lynn Ellen. Thank you, good morning again. Uh, Chairwoman Partridge, Chairman Starr, and committee members. I'm Lynn Ellen Schmoller. I live in Essex. I'm the program lead for the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative at the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. Thanks again for hosting this annual Working Lands Legislative Visit. 
To support the work of the board and nimbly get dollars to businesses, I do want to acknowledge some of the staff in agriculture who dedicated part-time hours in 2021, Diana Ferguson and Gina Slicero. In late 2021, the program welcomed a full-time agriculture development specialist, Claire Salerno. And Claire, if you want to turn your camera on and wave. I also enjoy working with Paul Frederick and Catherine Savidio from Forest Parks and Recreation and Randall Zott, partner program colleague from Commerce and Community Development. I'm really honored to lead a program that's making a difference for working lands enterprises and Vermont communities. I really know firsthand the hard work, wins and losses that come with running a business and the types of resources and supports all enterprises need to stay viable. My mother and grandfather owned and operated retail food stores and prior to, prior to joining the agency, I managed independently and cooperatively owned markets on both coasts. In my role at Working Lands, among my many priorities, I wanna highlight two. One, coordinate board governance nimbly, particularly as liaison to appointing offices, working with the WELIBs, eight subcommittees, and supporting Deputy Eastman's excellent facilitation of board meetings. <laughs> And two, mitigate the administrative burden of the application process for applicants, providing them with resources at the agency or matchmaking them to viability partners. What you'll hear today is evidence of what the Working Lands Enterprise Board does best, effectively deploy capital and business assistance to Vermont working lands, farm, food, and forest enterprises, and thereby to date, helping to create and protect jobs, over 500, help enterprises to generate revenue, over $45 million and keep the working landscape over 22,000 acres vibrant and vital. This board strategically allocates the funds it is appropriated, <clears throat> measures the influence of those allocations and communicates those results. I encourage you to visit the 2021 Working Lands Impact Report posted on the Working Lands website and routed to your committees. This program's consistent track record of demonstrating impact, effectively deploying and leveraging public dollars is a pretty stellar story. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn Ellen. We really appreciate your work. Um, now, do you, wanna, do you want to introduce the next folks or do you want me to do that? Well, we were hoping that we would just go in the order that Secretary Tebbets introduced all of us. Okay. For efficiency, so I'll, I'll just, that's all right. I'll I think folks we'll know who's going next. I think Molly Mahar is going next. And I'll just sort of cue folks. And we have another hour and a quarter. So I'm mindful of time. I, we want to hear from everybody. So Molly, go right ahead. Well, good morning. Thank you very much, Chairwoman uh, Partridge. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks also to uh, your committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee, uh, to Secretary Tebbets, and also to Lynn Ellen Schmoller. She does a great job. Um, she's our liaison with the program, and uh, she does a great job and is really wonderful to work with. Um, I'm Molly Mahar. I'm president of the Vermont Ski Areas Association. Um, it's nice to see you all again, and I hope next year that I'll be able to be there in person. Um, it's really an honor to be able to speak with you this morning about the importance of supporting the Working Lands Enterprise uh, Initiative and being able to fund these grants each year. Our working lands shape the character of Vermont. Our mountains, our farms, and our forests are iconic to the state's identity, and they are what draw people here. They are critical for sustainability of our economy, our environment, and of our climate. Ski industry is proud to be a part of Vermont's working lands and is committed to supporting and helping to grow other businesses with which we share this landscape. Over the years, the businesses and projects that we have supported were chosen because they reflect our own values, which are rooted in Vermont's cultural and historical heritage. Stewardship of the land, contributions to the state's economy, and the pride that we feel from living and working in the Green Mountain State. These important businesses and projects support a vibrant and diverse economy through responsible use and stewardship of the land. A healthy working landscape supports resiliency in the face of a climate, a changing climate, and that's something that's critical for Vermont now and into the future. Over the past few years, the Vermont Ski Areas Association has been able to support a diverse group of projects that 
have helped to educate children and families about the importance of farming in Vermont, helped to support responsible forestry and a healthy forest products market that are so critical to keeping large tracts of forest land intact and maximizing carbon sequestration, helped a business that builds season extending greenhouse structures to meet the growing demand from Vermont small farms, supported another farm business that's dedicated to preserving the diversity of fruit bearing trees that grow well in a northern climate. And this year's grant will support a project that will help guide BIPOC farmers in gaining access to land, helping to promote diversity and equity. And the range of these projects and businesses and the way that they allow the ski industry to support different facets of the state's working lands is really unique to the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. And we are pleased and proud to continue this collaborative partnership. And I would also like to thank the board for all of their hard work um, when they go through and, and look at all of these grant applications and award these grants. So uh, thank you very much for your time this, this morning. I was very pleased to be able to be here. And thank you, Molly, for all of your work. We really appreciate it. Um, next up is Charlie Hancock. Welcome, good morning, um, <laughs> morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity today. Um, so for the record, my name is Charlie Hancock. I'm a consulting forester based up here in Montgomery. Um, I also currently serve as the vice chair of the Working Lands Enterprise Board. Since this program's inception, the Working Lands Enterprise Fund has funded over $7.3 million in projects, leveraging an additional $11 million to 249 enterprises. And these investments continue to make an impact across all 14 of our counties. These investments are designed to support businesses at critical growth stages with a specific focus on maintaining an active, working, and vibrant landscape. The foundation of Vermont's economies and communities, and frankly, as Molly pointed out, our identity here in the state. It's also important to remember as we think about this landscape that these businesses have a conservation effect, keeping farms as farms and forests as forests. I can't help but think about the opportunity we have right now to look at our sector through the lens of climate adaptation and resilience as well as community vitality and economic opportunity. We have an opportunity at the critical moment we're in to really cement the connections that need cementing and catalyze transformational change through our investments and lift up our work as part of the natural climate solutions that we need, just as articulated in this first iteration of our climate action plan. Much of the work of the Working Land Enterprise Board itself is governance. Our committees facilitate planning and analysis that supports effective and efficient board decision-making that in turn amplifies our impact. The grant review process often brings together public and private thought partners who make investment recommendations that proactively address the board's strategic considerations and opportunities, enabling the initiative to both be innovative and responsive as we address both the challenges and immense opportunities that we have before us. So thank you very much for your continued support. Um, and at this point, I think I'd like to pass it off to our friend Danny Fisco, the Director of Forest Parks and uh, Director of Forests at the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. All right, thanks, Charlie. Go right ahead, Danny. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to visit with you about the Working Lands Initiative. I am here on behalf of Commissioner Snyder, who sends his regrets. He's in a Zoom window in another committee testifying right now. Um, I am Daniel Fitzko. I'm a director of forest with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, and I've been in my role for the past three years. And honestly, I have not had that much engagement with the initiative or the board until recently. And I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to tell you how impressed I have been with the board and the overall impact of this initiative. It is truly a partnership of balanced voices that is orchestrated by the team really well at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And the board really works hard and together to make decisions for the best interest of Vermont's working land enterprises and the future of Vermont. I had the privilege this year to sit in on the planning committee for their symposium. The symposium was held to help determine how to invest this unprecedented $5.3 million with FY22 funds. I've been around grant programs for a long time. I've been with the state for over 20 years. And typically when we get more money, we, we channel it in the same way that we've always channeled, just tack, tacked it on. Um, with the short time frame to move these funds, most boards would have went in that direction. Did they take the easy way? No. They took the time to step back, to think big, 
and to think forward. They listened to stories curated by a team. That's where I came in. I helped tell one of the stories. What does Vermont look like 10 to 20 years from now? What are the challenges and the opportunities for our working land enterprises? With the goal to consider how to put these funds to work to meet the current challenges and opportunities today and 20 years from now. They listened and they visioned and they determined where Vermont needs to strategically invest. They considered diversity, equity, and inclusion. They considered our climate crisis. They considered the current and future workforce. They considered what technical supports business, businesses need to thrive. And they considered the current and future Vermonters. And the outcomes of this thoughtful and intelligent work is in the grants that they offered. Already, $2.1 million have been awarded since January to across all sectors, across all counties of Vermont in the following areas. There are service part provider grants. These are given to organizations to support the vitality of enterprises, giving them businesses the technical resources they need to succeed. Small business infrastructure projects. The board recognizes that business, businesses come in all shapes and sizes. And these grants touch businesses of all shapes and sizes, from small farm stands to large manufacturing facilities. These particular funds support market sales strategies and enhancing production and manufacturing efficiencies at a smaller scale. There was a special focus on meat processing and slaughter enterprises for processing and distribution. This specifically addresses a known infrastructure bottleneck. They also had producer association grants. Associations are often the backbone to support businesses. These funds help with organiz organizational development, including business structure, onboarding, governance, board training, and capacity, really core fundamental components of a successful association. $3.2 million will be awarded in April. The grants are in the review process now and they are for supply chain impact and market level infrastructure impact. These projects are designed to keep the pool in the supply chain, to keep it moving and, and reduce the barriers and meet the larger investment needs with grants up to $250,000. As someone connected to the forestry side and knowing the challenges of our forest sector, the board listened, understood and thought hard about how to meet the needs in all sectors and all types of enterprises. And they understood that in many cases in the forestry sector, investments are needed at a larger scale to really make impact. Equipment and machinery are expensive, whether you're in the woods or you're in the mill. And they responded with these larger $250,000 grants. It's been awesome to have a window into the board's good work. It is truly a working, progressive, thoughtful, collaborative and impact-driven model in the state. Uh, before I pass it on to the next speaker, as part of Forest Parks and Recreation, I know the commissioner would want me to recognize the R in our department, Recreation, and share gratitude for our longtime recreation partner, but also our longtime working lands partner, Ski Vermont. Ski Vermont recognizes the importance of our working lands and our shared values. And since 2017, Ski Vermont has infused over $80,000 to support We Love Grants. To me, that's the hallmark that says how much Vermont's rural economy relies on the success of the Working Lands Initiative. Thank you, Molly, for being here in Ski Vermont and for investing and pulling together with We Love for Vermont's Working Lands future. Thank you for your time and listening. Thank you, Danielle. We really appreciate it. And again, kudos to Molly and her work. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is we go through all of our speakers and then when we at the end, just make notes, committees, and, and we can ask questions at the end. I just want to make sure everybody gets in. We're, we're doing well. So next up is Randall Sott. Randall is not an unfamiliar face to those of us here <laughs> in the State House. Welcome, Randall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And for the record, I'm Randall Zott, Partner Program Liaison for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. 
Uh, and yes, when I last saw some of you, I was I was representing the beautiful Windsor 41 district. Um, but that district has since received a major upgrade uh, by the, the new member from Barnard there in House Ag. Um, I'm happy to see that. Great improvement for the district. Um, uh, and although we are focusing um, mostly on fiscal uh, year 21 impact, one thing I wanted to note, because I did a quick scan before uh, coming here, I, I looked at uh, Working Lands Enterprise Initiative funding through the years, and the initiative has funded projects in the legislative districts of 10 of the 13 um, joint ag members here today, which is quite impressive, I think. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and this program touches on both the commerce and the community development side of our mission. Um, as to commerce, Vermont's food, farm, forest, and wood product sector are a critical economic engine for the state. And these grants encourage innovation and risk taking to, to bring these co companies to the next phase. A Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is unique because it invests in the businesses and organizations that are keystones to support our working lands economy. Without these enterprises and organizations, other businesses would not have the same access to markets or growth potential. They're the backbone of the Vermont economy. And as to community, uh, the Working Lands um, Entrepreneurs are also part, are part of the heart of our community's landscapes. Uh, they're an integral part to what continues to make Vermont a quality place to live. And I would point out that there are obvious ways. Um, there are, they are community hubs. They have on-farm events or they host uh, class field trips, but there are also the subtle ways that they contribute to, com to community, like donating maple syrup to pancake breakfasts. And I wanted to share uh, a couple of highlights from a visit to one of our uh, fiscal year 2021 grantees. I went to Jasper Hill Creamery to sort of see how the grant was being implemented and see the impact that it had on their operation. And uh, Jasper Hill does what so many of our working lands folks do. They are stewards of the landscape. They support other working lands businesses. They create jobs, they innovate, and they preserve traditions, which I think is a valuable piece of this program. Um, and there are two things in particular that I wanted to share. One is a very easy piece, which is, uh, and it's mentioned in the impact report that you all uh, will have received. Jasper Hill did an analysis of their lifetime expenditures by zip code and noted that they make 79% of their expenditures within the state of Vermont. And that alone is pretty impressive. But the really astonishing piece is that they did a further analysis and they saw that 62% of their expenditures are within 15 miles of their farm, which I just blows me away. I think that's super impressive. Then there's a little more subtle piece of their impact that I think it's just important to share. It was very noteworthy. It was a minor thing, but it, it, did, it, did, it did stand out. And then just that they employ two uh, forestry professionals to harvest spruce trees from local woodlands. And they extract the cambium to wrap one of their award-winning cheeses, Harbison, if you've ever, ever had the pleasure of trying it. And they also mill the spruce boards and use those boards to age their cheeses in the cellars at Jasper Hill. And uh, the economic, excuse me, the economic impact of that might be small. Um, but as all of you know, it's the, every little revenue stream that can be stitched together for working lands businesses uh, is important and it keeps a woodlot well managed. And that is difficult to measure, but it's another thread in the, the larger weave of what makes the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative so valuable for Vermont. And I didn't have this in my uh, prepared remarks, but I did just wanna emphasize to the committees what good hands this program is in. Having you know, briefly been witness to the various board meetings, the board members are astonishingly accomplished, thoughtful in their work. And just another little operational detail on the staff side that you may not be aware of, but it's just it just shows the level of care and attention that, that is applied to this program. Uh, there's, a, there's a backside grant application system that people have to enter all their information into. Sometimes people start applications and they don't finish. Now, in a lot of grant making capacity, that stuff just kind of goes unnoticed. But in this in this program, the staff says, hmm, why did these people not finish their applications? And they actually get back in touch with these people and contact them and find out why to see if there's an impediment in the grant making process. And that level of attention and care to detail to me just shows everything you need to know about how how seriously people take uh, their work in this in this initiative. So, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Randall. Really appreciate your perspective. Um, and next up is Ellen Kaler. Ellen, welcome. 
Hi there. Nice to see you all again. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, also a big fan of this program, as you all know. And uh, I've been serving along with my counterparts of Sarah Isham and Gus Selig on the board since its inception, because in the statute, uh, you may recall there are three ex officio seats that don't rotate off the board and are not and are not members of the administration. And our role is to help provide some consistency and and historical knowledge over time, uh, as well as some deep uh, expertise in the working land sector uh, as a whole as the board is then considering strategic investments in our sector. So we provide a lot of consistency, we provide a lot of historical knowledge, uh, a lot of content knowledge, but then ultimately we don't actually vote on the projects themselves. So we can influence, we can inform, but just so you know, we don't actually vote uh, on the grant awards themselves. Um, it's also important to know that, um, uh, that you know, part of the reason why in, in, in the case of, of my position, it was named in the, in the statute, the executive director of the Sustainable Jobs Fund was in part this link to the, the farm to plate investment program. Um, and so what I try to do when I'm at board meetings is represent uh, not just uh, the farm and food sector as well as the forest product sector, but also what is been represented in the farm to plate strategic plan uh, that have had so many Vermonters input into that process. And uh, as you know, from H566, we're also all contemplating that a uh, similar kind of, uh, having a similar kind of plan for the forest products industry, which again, would be used as a foundational document to really support strategic uh, investments and decision-making uh, by the board as a whole. Now, one of the things that I think it's important to, to know is, is not only, how, we know how popular this program is with all of you. you, you all have it very close to your heart. Um, it's also a very popular program within the, the farm and food sector. And that's because you all have been consistently uh, providing funding every year. The challenge, of course, is that, that, that there is not a consistent level of funding year over year, which makes um, it difficult for the private sector in particular to plan thoughtfully about, well, what, what's the right year for me to apply? Because I have a big project I want to do. Geez, you know, there's a whole bunch of money this year. There might be a million dollars, but next year, maybe that'll only be $500,000. And so it can be really that choppiness in, in allocation is really challenging, which is why in the new Farm to Play Strategic Plan, priority strategy number one is to try to ensure that every year there is at least $1.5 million in funding available to the program. Now, this past year, fiscal 22, you all did an amazing thing. You, you put five and a half million dollars into this program. Um, and, and, and that's really uh, unprecedented. And <laughs> we, we still blew way past that figure in terms of requests. So as you, I think all know, in the Budget Adjustment Act, um, there's an additional uh, $2.2 .2 million added to the fiscal 22 uh, budget for this program. And we will not have any problem disp dispatching those funds. Um, uh, as you may know, when we were going into the supply chain innovation and, and, and infrastructure innovation grant rounds, which are those larger rounds, larger dollars that Danny Fitzko mentioned, <coughs> we only had uh, uh, $3 million left to award in fiscal 22, and we had over $7 million in requests. And these were strong proposals, right? If you're going to do a $250,000 uh, grant, you, you burn through a lot of millions of dollars pretty pretty quickly on a small number of projects. And so we're very, very grateful that uh, it looks like there'll be this extra $2 million. I haven't kept up with where the Budget Adjustment Act is in the process. So I'm hoping that we're all locked in and that extra 2 million will come because that'll mean that we'll have that, we'll have a, an extra 2 million to put towards these larger grants, which are designed to be uh, really impactful in terms of of the marketplace as a whole and the market for products. And they don't just benefit one business in, in either the farmer forest side or the forest uh, and, and wood side of, of, of things. If they're actually designed to have multiple ripple effects on many, many other businesses. Um, and so you get a lot of bang for a little bit of bucks 
uh, when you uh, invest in some of these uh, larger grants that we're giving out. So I really want to thank you, you all. We we continue to get oversubscribed with requests in this program. So all the more reason why um, anything that can be done to increase the amount of support for this program over time and to have it be consistent year over year uh, is really, really critical. Uh, so I want to thank you uh, very much for your support uh, and for this program, your dedication to it. Um, it really does make a big difference uh, for the businesses that and the service provider organizations that work with businesses to be able to continue to really grow this sector. And, um, and as you know, we've, we've been able to grow the, the farm and food side from 5% local consumption up to, up to 17.8%. So um, we're looking forward to seeing what we can do on the forest product side in a similar vein going forward. So thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Ellen. <laughs> we always, excuse me, <laughs> we always love hearing from you and we, we, um, we love the um, the great success that this program has been. Um, next up is Gus Seelig, who is the executive director of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Gus, welcome. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for having me this morning. And I'm just going to repeat a number of things you've already heard with perhaps a little different take. Like Ellen, I'm an ex officio member of the board um, uh, as the director uh, at VHCB. I sat, served on the board the first three years of ex existence, and then Ella Chapin represented us until her uh, retirement last year. And then I came back. And what I want to say is that um, Lynn Ellen's management of this program has put us in a whole different place than in those infancy years. And Allison's leadership of the board is just, and facilitation has just been tremendous. This is a much more sophisticated operation. I want to just share a couple of overlaps, uh, the reasons that we're on the board, I think, go to both our mission, uh, which is to, con it says in the statute, to conserve for future generations the essential characteristics of the Vermont countryside. And that's not just physical characteristics, that's human characteristics. And this program is signaling to young people all across the state that the work they're doing on our lands, working landscape, really matters and it's causing more investment. So um, I'm not surprised at all that the signal you sent with the one-time investment last year has been well oversubscribed. And I think it speaks to the desire for vitality in our rural communities. Uh, the second piece of overlap really is with our farm and forest viability program. Uh, VHCB invests over a million dollars a year from the transfer tax in that program. And in addition to advice, we are an applicant in the service provider category and have worked closely with the agency, uh, both in COVID relief, but in ongoing business planning through that program uh, that has reaped wonderful results. And I think the biggest result is it helps young entrepreneurs be much more ready to be competitive for the grants that WeLab offers. Um, and there's been a great amount of success that way over and over again, and we'll send you some of the stories and you'll hear some of those stories uh, from uh, participants in the program. But um, the business planning really helps people be more analytical, more strategic, and it's a great investment that WeLab is able to make. Uh, Ellen's farm to plate work suggests we really have to ramp that work up. It's something we're committed to working uh, with all of you to do. Um, and, but I think that it's really critical that, that that we are at a time, and you've all seen the changes in Vermont's real estate market uh, over the last two years since the pandemic began, that I don't think will go away just when the pandemic recedes, because we, we're, we're going to change as a country with remote work. And that's going to mean more and more people want to live in Vermont while they have jobs other places. And so the cost of real estate in Vermont is going to go up. The entry into working lands businesses, the pressure on our working landscape is going to increase. And the signal you send both through the work you do with us and through WeLab is going to be critical that we want to continue not to suburbanize rural Vermont, but to make it a place where people work and grow families and support communities. And that vitality, I think, is really the secret sauce beyond any individual business having places that people work in and make their living really makes Vermont and Vermont's small communities really special places to be. So 
thank you for the great support you've given to WeLab that you've given to us, and we look forward to many years of continued partnership. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gus. We really appreciate you being here today and all your hard work. And we're going to move on to Sarah Isham, who is the Director of Agricultural Lending for the Vermont Economic Development Authority. Um, I'm not sure where I'm seeing you here, but... <laughs> yeah. <it's> <laughs> There you are. Hi, Sarah. Sorry. Hi, thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity. I am the designee for Cassie Polhemus, who is the CEO of Vermont Economic Development Authority, known as VITA. And um, agricultural and forestry lending at VITA is done through Vermont Agricultural Credit Corporation, uh, sometimes known as VAC, although we generally market ourselves as VITA now and uh, with both our commercial and agricultural lending programs. And the Vermont Economic Development Authority is an ex officio member of WELAB, which is allowed for partnering and leveraging opportunities. VITA's role in providing financing to farm and forest-based businesses to enhance Vermont's economy has allowed the Working Lands Enterprise Board and VITA to work collaboratively in identifying gap, gaps and opportunities for these industries. And the WELAB consistently provides grants to businesses and from time to time philanthropically supports um, lenders throughout Vermont, financial institutions to provide innovative financing tools that effectively leverage public dollars to address these system gaps and opportunities. And um, the Working Lands Grants back in 2016 for the Organic Transition Loan Program was one example of that. And um, we were able to assist a number of conventional dairy farmers as they transitioned to organic milk production. In the end, there were some funds that were still remaining and we directed those to Vermont VHCB for the um, Farm and Forest Viability Program to assist dairy farmers. In doing so, we would complements the day-to-day -day work of Vermont lenders and capital providers. And there have been a number of different um, businesses that we have worked with at VITA that have benefited from um, working lands enterprise grants. Um, many of them are larger businesses. But there have also been a couple of examples where our lending really was, um, was leveraged by working lands grants that provided capital for these farmers to be able to really to cover their share of, um, of doing a project. And a recent one was for, was for a couple to purchase an existing value-added business, which they moved to their own farm. And they, they needed to have funding to help them um, build a barn, creamery, and purchase machinery and equipment as part of that business. And a We Love grant was um, directly beneficial in leveraging our financing there. We have also in the past um, partnered in, with some grants that helped with a uh, cider making business. and. Um, also with providing climate controlled storage for a vegetable farm. And so it is an ongoing relationship. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to serve as a member of the board and to contribute, contribute on behalf of VITA. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Sarah. I really appreciate your work as well. Um, we're now going to move to Steve Bick, who is the owner of Northeast Forests, LLC. Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group. I'm, uh, I'm here today from North Faston, where we got a terrific broadband upgrade last year, and that makes us all a bit, a bit easier. So I'm a forest economist uh, by training. I've been the recipient of multiple um, working land service provider contracts and grants. And, uh, you know, my particular interest is working with forest-based small businesses. I had worked around the region, the Northeast, for quite a while doing a variety of forestry consulting. And as I uh, kind of went from state to state to do continuing education workshops, I was drawn uh, to Vermont uh, more and more because of the great people here. Uh, I think you probably already know this, but FPR 
as a state agency is viewed in other states as just a model. They're really well thought of. Um, you know, they like the work that Danny and everyone does there and Mike. And in particular, they like to work with Paul Frederick. And so I, I'm one of those people. I kept coming back here. And then in, in 2013, Liz Gleason, who I think had just started with VHCB, reached out to me to do some one-on-one -on -one consulting with some of the loggers and other small businesses here. And it, it kind of picked up from there. Uh, in, uh, in 2019, I wanted to really expand and focus more on these types of businesses. And I started an LLC for, for my company in Vermont and, and also started a DBA for the, the Forest Business School. About that time, Sam Lincoln, who has, I think, contacted me every week for the last 20 years with a question or two, he put me in touch with Lynn Ellen and I learned more about what Working Lands does. So at that time, uh, I had this idea for a cohort-based learning program with mid-career small business members. And, and Working Lands funded, uh, funded the pilot version of this, which we held last year. We had uh, a number of terrific small business people uh, and one or two key employees participate. Cohort learning is kind of, um, I didn't even know the term a year ago, but it is, it's kind of developed organically. You know, we have to have opportunities for learning and growing businesses that fit uh, a working lifestyle. And, and, and so, you know, I wanted to take the businesses I was interacting with where people were really good at the work. They're, they're, they're good at harvesting timber. They're good at giving uh, forestry advice to landowners, but maybe they haven't focused on the business side of things. So this program was kind of built for that. And it was built uh, to fit into to people's everyday work life. So we use a combination of of audio books and podcasts and other readings, and then meet once a week. And we talk about how does this apply to our work? And, and what I had hoped for there was to develop supportive peer groups. And that's, that's kind of what we got. I, I'd, I'd like to tell you about uh, some of the people uh, that have been through the program. Tyler Dallas has a consulting forestry firm down in, in Reading. Uh, he came into the program and said, you know, I'm here, I've been working as an employee for a company for a while, and someday I wanna start my own business. And about two months into the program, he said, you know, I wanna start this business probably six months from now. Well, another two or three weeks went by and he said, I quit my job and I started my business. And, and the response from the group was terrific. Everyone gave him supportive advice, but one or two people in particular reached out and put him in connection in, with some landowners who, um, who needed some advice and suddenly he had work to do and that worry about was he gonna be able to support his family went away. And I'm happy to tell you he has more work than he can, he can do right now. He came into it at a good time. He applied some of the things he learned and he leaned on, on some peers. So, uh, you know, uh, another, another person we had in the group, we had a woodworker, no. Nate Flasha from uh, no, Black Craftsman. And it, Nate had been, you know, not participating, you know, so much in the primary forest economy. And this put him in touch with those people. So as a result, he is sourcing more local wood. He realizes he doesn't have to work with big corporations to get the supplies that he needs. Another person, Everett Thurston, decided he wanted to expand his business. I was able to help him get a value-added producer grant to look at getting into firewood and, and into uh, developing a, or, or starting a sawmill at some point. So, you know, we've been able to leverage the funds that, that you have provided to Working Lands through this program. Participants last year reported that their personal productivity went up by almost 50% and they projected increased revenues of 30 to 40%. You know, this year I've got some other folks that, that are, you know, we're partway through the program and it kind of works out. They learn some things, but they also kind of have an ongoing interaction with each other. And with me, Christy Bowman down at Colton Enterprises has got some big plans and, and is working on things. And I hear from her every week about the things we uh, discuss in the program and how she might apply them at work. Uh, I, I want you to know that the funding you put into this is having an impact. It's having an impact with a lot of small businesses that, are, that you know, they protect the working landscape. I was able to leverage this and get some funding from uh, Farm Credit's Ag Enhancement Program to put on a startup, a boot camp for forest-based startup businesses, and that's going to happen later on in the spring. 
So I've been really excited to work with Lynn Ellen. Uh, I think I've developed a good work relationship with her. Uh, the administration, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of public agencies. The administration here has been fantastic. And um, I can't say enough about the, the terrific impact it's, it's having. I don't know if there's time for any questions, but uh, I'd be, be glad to, I'll talk all day if you let me, so I better stop. Well, Steve, we really appreciate that and we thank you. And I'm asking committee members to please jot down their questions so that at the end, and I think we're gonna have plenty of time for questions, but I wanna make sure everybody gets a chance to testify and then we'll go to um, question and answer. So um, thank you again for being here today and for telling us your exciting story. Uh, next up is Joe Vossen. Um, Joe is the owner of Vermont Bean Crafters and Vermont All Souls. So Joe, go right ahead. All right, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Joe Vossen and as mentioned, I run um, Vermont Bean Crafters, which is Got its start in West Rutland, Vermont about 12 years ago now. Uh, and then as well as All Souls Tortilla up in currently Burlington, Vermont, where uh, we do a similar mission of making value-added products out of local organic grains. And um, Bean Crafters received in uh, 2016 a working lands grant that uh, allowed us to scale up our capacity to aggregate, store, and clean dry beans. And for us, you know, um, <laughs> That is a sector when we look at the local food movement, a lot of things that you know, were getting investment and attention that was relatively underrepresented in the overall mix at that point. And for us, uh, we were able to use those grant funds and from 2016 to 2017, saw a 20% uptick in our um, gross revenue numbers. Uh, we, with that equipment, um, are also lending that equipment out at no cost. Um, because we receive them through public funds, we try to treat these things as kind of the commons. And so there's a handful of other farms around Vermont and some in New York that uh, will use our threshing machine, our seed cleaning equipment um, to do their small grains. Some of those we buy in, some of those retain and uh, use to direct market in their communities. So when we think about the ripple effects of the opportunities of one organization and how those bleed into the others, I think it's really interesting um, and important to, to give voice to those sorts of things. Beyond the uh, other aspects and ripple effects of the working lands funds that we were able to get, um, you know, at the time of receiving that, we were just a small business with, it was me and three part-time um, people, you know, making, you know, okay wages. And over time, we've been able to grow our markets and grow um, yeah, mature right. the business to the point where now we have, um, uh, three full-time and three part-time people all, you know, we're now our, our wages are about twice what they were before getting this funding back in the day. We're from a quality assurance standpoint, being able to bring in grains that um, grains and beans that otherwise might not meet spec and yeah. raise into spec for growers that don't have uh, post-harvest handling infrastructure on their own has been a big boon for us to be able to work with smaller growers, uh, which is a big part of what we're hoping to do. And um, within all of that, when I look forward and all the things we're supposed to do now, even with the setbacks of um, you know, COVID and navigating the last couple of years, we're in the midst of rolling out uh, new products and a new retail ready dry bean program um, in pre-printed packaging that we're going to be pushing with a broker to get into regional supermarket chains. And in all of this, we are working on keeping all of the, the beans and greens that we're working with source identified through the supply chain so that the network of growers that we work with are uh, transparently represented in the products we're putting out to the world um, moving forward. So, so keep your eyes out for that rollout moving forward. Um, when I guess I would also just say, you know, being um, along this way, we were also people who have benefited from the work of farm viability, uh, both through technical assistance and, and, and grants. And I feel like the maturation of the business on the outside of having gotten to work with uh, folks like Rose Wilson um, just gave us a lot more confidence and aptitude to, to grow the business from a stable foundation. And I really, when I think of all of my friends and peers that are in the food space, I, I struggle to think of 
any that haven't um, beneficially utilized the Farm Viability Technical Assistance Program. I can't say enough good things about it. And uh, I use that for both bean crackers and all souls and was really lucky to work with Rose Wilson on both of those. And um, I'd say the only other thing um, put out there is that I likewise could talk all day long. So um, I'm happy to leave it there and leave more time for questions so I can speak to anything um, that you have in mind in particular. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Um, it's good to hear about your success. Um, Anson, uh, we've heard from all of the scheduled speakers. I'm wondering if there's anyone um, that you see who would want to um, who would want to say something. I don't want to cut anyone off, but it's up to you. No, I think I think we're in good shape. Um, if there's any questions that folks want to um, help us with. All right, I, I see um, Bobby Starr is waving his finger at us. So we'll, we'll go to Bobby. And then others, I, I can't necessarily see your hands. So <clears throat> if you um, raise your hand, Kira will help me figure out, I think she can tell me whose hands are up. But Bobby, why don't you kick it off? Well, you're muted, Bobby. <laughs> <clears throat> I've been good. I even pushed the milk button. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, I want to thank um, all you folks that testified this morning. Uh, one question came up in regards to the uh, $2 million that the House put in and where the, the supplemental budget was in the process. And I, I must say that... Um, the Senate, of course, I, I'm lucky that I serve on approach as well as ag. Uh, so, but I was lucky um, in the Senate, uh, there wasn't hardly a question from anybody in regards to working lands or our ag money. And we passed the bill back to the House on a 30-0 vote. Uh, so, you know, it's really, I think, very solid that we're going to get the extra uh, two million. It's in, you know, there's always some things between the House approach and the Senate approach that, that's different. And so, so all they got to do is work out those differences. Um, you know, I, I listened very closely this morning and, and, you know, what a marvelous story uh, we've heard. Uh, and 10 or 11 years ago, when we were starting the working lands program, when you're starting a, a program, you never, you never really know how it's going to work out. And of course, the last thing legislators uh, want is getting egg on their face from starting a program and having it go belly up or not work properly. Uh, and, you know, I, I must say that I've been pretty, I've been pretty fortunate over the years to watch farm and ag and rural Vermont programs come together and they've worked well. And one thing that that's impressed me about working lands is the process that the applicants have to go through. Um, and the, the great thing is, if you think about it, we've got ag, we've got VITA, we've got the forestry agency, VHCB, ACCD, um, you know, all these in the regional planning uh, people are even in on it. Uh, but when you have a, a strong group uh, so diverse and having a program that's diverse, like working lands is, it, it really can work well and, and is working well. Um, I think, the, you know, I should say too that we got five extra million, I think it was this last year, plus now another two. But of course, 
that wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't gotten a, a load of money from Washington. And we've got this money for a few years uh, coming. And so it's, it's really, I think, smart business uh, to build our base is very strong. And then as that money slows down, we'll have enough small businesses rolling and in pretty good shape so they can move forward and, and supply jobs and help our rural economies. So I, I guess, um, you know, I, I just want to say thanks a lot for all the hard work that all you folks have done. Um, and it, that makes our job easy in the legislature when you have a program that's successful, it's worked, it's from basically all corners of the state. Uh, I guess we still got three or four counties to hit on. But um, yeah, I, I think the board's done a, an excellent job in, the crew doing the work to make sure that this uh, will move uh, forward uh, in the future. So thanks again for all the work that you do uh, out there. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Bobby. Um, I, are there any hands up yet, Kara? Okay, so uh, Tom has his hand up. Go ahead, Tom. Yes, uh, Carolyn, I, I have a question for Steve Beck. Steve, uh, as you look into the future, uh, say the next five or 10 years through your crystal ball, where would you uh, see entrepreneurs, in, in small business entrepreneurs especially, uh, looking at what kind of forest processing products, uh, what kind of pro uh, forest activity do you see uh, entrepreneurs going into? You're muted, Steve. <laughs> Sorry, I do that all the time. So I, I think they're gonna have to take on the challenges that are there. So we have a lot of, of the working landscape here and current use and, and landowners needing services and need landowners that wanna do good work on their property. And I see us moving, um, for, and we're already seeing this moving farther from just simple, I'm gonna pay you and harvest your timber to I'm gonna help you accomplish your, your silvicultural goals and it may be more of a service that has to be paid for. Uh, and the other, you know, the, the uh, labor force issue is, is, no, is, is no secret to anyone here. Uh, they're gonna have to solve that problem for people. And, and I think to some degree that's gonna be with, with more equipment or with better equipment, more cut to length and that sort of thing. So I see, I see uh, problems that create opportunities and, and whoever can do that at scale is really gonna benefit. Thank you. All right, Tom, you need to put your mask back on. All right, next up is um, John O'Brien in Tunbridge. Tom, John, go ahead. Thank you, Carolyn. Looking at these tiles today, it feels like the Pro Bowl game in Las Vegas. There's so many stars here from the farm and forest world uh, that it's, it's quite impressive. Um, and also hearing for the last hour about the successes of this program. I think we're all fans in House Ag and Senate Ag. My question then thinking about this is, if anybody wants to jump in, where, where have there been failures that you've learned from or, or what could, could working lands do better um, besides just money? You know, what are the challenges going forward? Anyone? <laughs> No failures, that's good. <laughs> I, I, I think Lynn Allen could probably touch on that. I know, you know, we're constantly looking at our metrics and when reviewing grants and uh, trying to figure out if the way that we're approaching it is fair and equitable. Um, those are one of the, you know, big thing that comes to my mind. Uh, Lynn Allen, you have thoughts? Thank you, Deputy Eastman. I think I would rewind back to something that Randall noted, which was the touch point of navigating all of the applicants who don't get funded. And so when I came in, um, just because of building the plane as it was flying, it was a new program. When I came in, 
you got an automated message that just said um, you won't be awarded. And I shifted that to make sure that I coordinate specifically with each applicant and give them feedback because we have a review process, which is pretty robust. And so I can take those comments, translate them in a way that's encouraging and gets the, the enterprise to understand what it is they need to work on, not just for assembling a better application, but potentially matchmaking them to viability so that they're actually centering and figuring out what it is in their operation that they might need some help with. So I think that was a that was a solving of a, a finding a solution to an old problem. Um, I would say that I've been really impressed with the board's ability to flex when they needed to um, in fiscal year 19. Um, really led by the efforts of former Deputy Commissioner Sam Lincoln, Allison Eastman, Gus Seligshop, many others, there was a real concerted focus on building executive business skills and scale up investments, particularly for forest sector. Um, forest sector enterprises have pretty expensive equipment. And so for infrastructure, um, the board shifted from capping grants out at about 45,000 to 50,000 to today where we're gonna be awarding projects up to $250,000. So again, I think I'm just pointing out the finding solutions to the old problems. Mm -hmm. um, I think a challenge for, for applicants, it continues to be, and we're working hard uh, within the agency to mitigate this, as I mentioned earlier, really looking at the administrative burden. Um, helping them through the application process. So I conduct one-to-one -one meetings with interested applicants. I think August through November of this year, I've had a total of 50. So that could be a 15 minute video visit. It could be a phone call. It could be a half hour video visit. It could be an hour. It could be follow-ups of, follow of emails, introducing them to viability partners. But I do think that's made a distinct difference. We designed uh, webinars that we record and we post on the website so folks can visit that if they can't make the webinar to also help them unpack um, everything that's needed to assemble an application. So that that's what I would share. Um, I'm not sure yeah. if there's any board members that would wanna speak to this as well. Thanks, Lynn Ellen. I noticed that Ellen, had, um, Ellen Kaler had unmuted herself and I wondered if you wanted to add to this, Ellen. Yeah, just very briefly, you know, I think that I think that generally speaking, things are are only really failures if we fail to learn from them. And I think, as Lynn Ellen said, this board has built a culture and the agency uh, supports that culture of continuous improvement. And so we're we're very reflective every year. We have an annual symposium for two days, usually or day and a half where we really take stock in like, what went well this past year? Where did we have some things that maybe were a little too sticky and didn't really quite work out as planned? And, and so we're constantly adjusting and making improvements. And, and I really think that, you know, everything, I can't support uh, Lynn Allen enough in how she's leading this program on a day-to-day -day basis. She's doing a phenomenal job. And that, that personal touch and outreach that she does really does make a difference because, Sometimes we get applications in where it's, it is really clear there's a nub of a good idea, but they're just not ready. And so then referring them, the board then, you know, will say, Let, let's refer them to the farm or forest viability program, or let's refer them to so-and-so. That information then gets back with really clear guidance, like this would really help you come back next year. And routinely year after year, we get applications back for a second, a second run at it, uh, uh, as Senator, Senator Starr was saying. And, and there's so much more improved, the applications and the concept and the readiness to receive those funds. And the last thing I'll just say is, you know, I also don't think that if we've had a very low, in air quotes, failure rate of, of, app, of awarded grantees that, we, that just couldn't complete the project, where we've had to um, de-obligate the funds and then re-obligate them. And for a program where you all said when this program got started in statute, the intention was don't just fund the easy things. Don't just do the one, the, the grants that you know are definitely going to succeed. Take some risks. 
be okay with some of these projects not working. And the board has always held that in our minds as we're making decisions. There's always a couple of applicants every year where we say, this might be those one, this that one that won't work, you know, or this is the one that might need a little extra hand holding. And you know, if they if we if they work, we 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 totally are excited. But if they don't, we're still okay with that because because we, we're taking the kind of risks that this kind of program was set up to do. And and I think that we're as long as we're always learning, uh, we're going to be okay. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Chris Pearson, you have your hand up. Go right ahead. Yeah. Thank you, and and great to hear from everybody today. Uh, it, it is one of the, the sort of routinely better uh, sessions we have in terms of sharing some good news, so appreciate it. Um, I, I, my question is, is, I guess for board members, um, I keep hearing, every year we hear about sort of discrete good projects, and, and I think as a whole that leads to a stronger uh, rural landscape and, and, and rural economy. But I, I'd love to understand your approach because uh, around sort of coordination, because we do hear this over and over that that you know you have a, a, a good producing farm, but they're struggling to get distribution or, or you know some of those missing middle pieces. We have our our food hubs in various iterations are are working on that. But could you just tell us how you approach that and? And um, maybe if there are projects specifically designed to meet some of those connector pieces of uh, our local food economy, and, and, and if that makes sense, I'd love to hear any comments along those lines. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Chris. Lynn Allen, is that a question for you? Who would like, Allison, were you thinking of answering that? Mm -hmm. I was uh, going to come our airspace, but I'd love to turn it over to Deputy Eastman. I think Ellen Kaler would also be an excellent person to answer this, or Vice Chair Hancock. Yes, Sorry, I, would. Okay. I, I was going to tee it up and say that you know our, our board meetings, uh, the discussions that we have around the grant applications, and uh, you know in totality who's there and uh, what the applications are lacking. We have grant reviewers that go through and. Um, grade each one of the applications. And usually as we uh, talk about the applications, we'll turn to those grant reviewers and ask them their thoughts. And then as a whole board collectively, we make recommendations and our note takers um, are very uh, diligent in getting those notes together so that our staff can communicate uh, to those that have applied. So I'll turn it over to Ellen and, and uh, then Charlie and see if they want to build on that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, totally ditto uh, what Secretary Eastman said. And I think, um, you know, we use the farm to plate strategic plan because we have it as, as a foundational document um, to, to give that intel into what where there are needs in the sector that's going to strengthen the farm and food sector. Um, and hoping we're going to have that on the forest product <laughs> side too um, soon. But a lot of it, it does happen that intel about whether a project is really strategic, how many businesses are going to be supported um, in that ripple effect of if we make this investment in this particular business, all of that does surface during the, the review meetings. There's routinely lots of extra information that the subject matter review, uh, experts, who are the reviewers, bring into the room. That that you uh, because the because the application itself is necessarily short, so we don't overwhelm people asking for a lot of details. There's just knowledge that we all have. Um, Bob Lesnikowski, for instance, is, is practically a, a walking encyclopedia uh, on all of the businesses that apply. Like the stuff that, that he just knows is amazing. And so that depth of knowledge, uh, of real subject matter expertise that we have on the board and with the, the extended reviewers that Lynn Ellen brings to the table, the staff from different agencies, other subject matter experts from the private sector, all of whom help to review and score these applications. Um, it, it really, I think, makes for really high quality decision making. And the other thing I will just say is at our annual symposium, 
as I mentioned before, when we step back and we take a look at what are we seeing on the horizon, we bring in uh, and have panelists that talk to us. So we've had panelists, for instance, on financing of the farm and food sector and the forest products industry. We've had food hubs in to give presentations. So we're also trying to make sure that we're staying fresh with what's happening on the ground. And we do that at our annual symposium. And that then tees up what we make, how we design the RFPs for the following fall, that then is what people apply for. If I can do something quickly, uh, I, I, I want to echo the comments about the, the power of the thought partnership we have here. And it's funny, I was going to actually point to Bob, too, as being kind of the guy that knows everything happening everywhere in the ag space. But yeah, the, the caliber of the people that we bring in is great. And the position that we sit in, I think, is critical because we, we kind of see the landscape, right? We are the nexus of information happening in these spaces, in these markets. And so, as it's been said, we we, we have a a very unique vantage point to see what's going on, identify opportunities. Um, the only other thing I'll add is I think it's important to remember that when we give out these grants, we're looking at kind of three different buckets. We've got our standard business grants, which are um, you know potentially transformational amounts of money for businesses, but from a state budget perspective, relatively small dollars. But we have these larger buckets of grants that look at supply chain impacts and market level impacts. And so that's where we get the projects in that actually tie different businesses together. You know, we're looking at ones this year around new packing lines for milk or re reopening sawmills that are gonna have impacts across both the ag and forest sectors. And so uh, I think that's important that we, as Ellen said, every year we kind of look at, you know, what our allocations are gonna be. If we really pay attention to where those big transformational changes can happen at the market level. And that's where we can really kind of, you know, um, you know twist the dials to make an impact there. Thanks, Charlie. Any any other questions? Chris, did that that answered your question? Yeah, I could talk like these guys. I, I could ask questions all day, but no, that's super. Thank you, and appreciate the good work. Yeah, yeah. Um, other questions for any of the folks who have joined us today, Vicky. Good morning, everybody. Um, Vicky Strong from Albany, and Joe Boston. I was just reading about your business. Um, on seven days, a really amazing article, uh, just to hear your story. And that's what I like when I come to this get together here are those personal stories and people's journeys uh, in their businesses. And Joe, I, I don't really have a question other than I'm really amazed at the amount of effort that it's taken you to launch your bean burgers and tortillas and so many other things I see in this article you're doing. And I, I know that you've had support, but you've worked hard and haven't even taken pay. It sounds like from the article a lot of the time. And it's the joke of uh, when a Vermonter has three jobs, what are they? They're lazy. It's like you have four or five things going on um, and successfully over time. Could you just maybe tell us, I mean, and maybe you did already, but now that I read your story, I, I hear it in a different way. What's your next venture you're launching here? It looks like growing beans, um, a firm, you want to do some fermentation. It looks like, what's your next venture? And, and again, just tell us a little bit how you feel blessed by the folks who've supported you. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really um, fortunate to um, have, I, I hope to not spend my 30s like I spent my 20s in terms of uh, burnout and um, hours work relative to, to pay receive. So I'm, I'm trying to work smarter, not harder these days, but uh, it's still, especially with staffing being what it is, uh, a little bit of a trick. But yeah, right now, um, the hard to think about all of the, you know, in, in the context of the Vermont working landscape, like in all these things we're talking about today, I think it's really also important to speak to just some of the inherent qualities of the Vermont agricultural community itself. And we would not exist at all if it wasn't for the goodwill and um, big hearts of folks like Greg Cox at Boardman Hill Farm, where we started Bean Crafters, who gave us uh, commercial kitchen space and land to grow at no cost and great inconvenience to himself. And at every different stage of the business, there's been these things that don't make headlines, but they're totally the difference between whether a small business like ours exists at all, let alone makes it to the next level. I do see, um, farm viability and working lands as catalytic and us being able to, instead of treading water, make a next step. 
being someone who did not, was not quote unquote bankable, you know, even with a profitable business, if you don't have assets to leverage, most mainstream banks aren't going to give you the time of day. So Vermont Community Loan Fund uh, is who we got most of our debt service from. Over time, the newer Vermont Farmers Fund has been transformational for us and other small producers. Access to capital is a big part of that. Um, it's really hard to cash flow the growth of a business without some of that, what I would call non-traditional financing options. And then in terms of the things that we're looking at doing next, um, at All Souls, we recently launched a new flour tortilla line that's um, just about a year old now, and we're in the midst of um, scaling, and that's going really well. And we have a super saturation of demand for that. We've been scaling our um, fried chip line and are looking at investing in equipment to scale up our chips, also a super saturation of demand in that. And so we're looking at a new continuous fryer. And then in the on the coattails of that, exploring with some farm partners on what the implications would be to add a, uh, a Vermont um, organic uh, potato chip line, which is something a Northeast uh, you know chip is something that I'm still beguiled does not exist in the marketplace. And I see having a huge uh, opportunity for us to really be uh, further synthesizing raw agricultural products into value added products and getting those products into markets where they otherwise might not have access. Um, and hopefully doing it in a way that is holding up the good work of the, the farms that make it all happen along the way. And then, yeah, down at Cloudwater Farm, which this past April, the farm that Bean Crafters has been renting for the last six years, we were able to um, close on. It's, it's a conserved farm, which is important, right? Because my partner and I were been looking for most of this last decade for a place and haven't found one um, that was quite affordable. So the fact that we could have a farmstead that go, was less than a two bedroom in Burlington goes for is speaks a lot to the role of um, land conservation in this broader conversation. I, I don't know too many people looking to enter agriculture right now that um, can, you know, be spending the time developing agricultural expertise and ag, you know, and then build up a nest egg with which to acquire agricultural land, let alone capitalize that land to make it profitable. So um, at that land, we're doing, uh, we're growing beans and small grains um, in the context of uh, doing perennial plantings. And I'm really interested in the opportunity over time for mass bearing crops, planting hazelnuts and chestnuts, and really looking forward to the opportunity for the interplay of these perennial um, <laughs> crops with the annual crops from a resilient economic and ecological resiliency. And in particular, because we have the commercial kitchen on the farm there, also building the value added products to support what I see as emerging sectors to be able to, as other growers are planting these things, we can be part of that patchwork quilt of making these things help meet the market um, in turnkey ways. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, I, I'm really excited about, you know, the the decades ahead, because I still see so much not getting done, um, but also all these little embers that are just like glowing and waiting, waiting to ignite um, across the, the working landscape here. Um, I think that's the most concise way I can answer that question. Sorry if it was a little well, Thank you, Joan, thank you. you. You inspired me today. I really want to try one of your bean burgers. <laughs> right. We might have to take a field trip. <laughs> yeah, come on, you're all welcome thank to find any time. <laughs> well, uh, that would be really fun if we could do that. Uh, thanks so much, Joe, for that answer. Uh, it sounds like you've got a lot of irons in the fire, and that's very exciting. Um, and I'll just say that this is one of, you know, when I look back on my career, this is one of my favorite bills that we ever worked on. And, I, you know, I remember as we were finalizing the um, committee of conference on this, um, Shap Smith gave me till midnight of this particular night. And for those of you who know me well, you know I like to be in bed by 8.30 or nine. Um, but we, we sat in the room uh, down in the Senate um, and we hammered this out. And at five minutes to midnight, we shook on this. <laughs> and I was really excited about that for a couple of reasons. Number one, we got this done. And it was, I, I just had a really good feeling about it. But also I had gotten a call from my son that my daughter-in-law was, was in labor and was probably gonna have my first grandchild the next day. So it was totally exciting. I got to shake on it and I got to head down to Albany Hospital for the birth. But anyway, 
Um, I, I want to thank you all for all of your hard work. This really takes an incredible amount of um, um, networking and thoughtfulness. And uh, I like Charlie's thought partnership um, expression. And uh, for those of you who I, are the, do, do people volunteer to be on the um, board? Um, or, or are we now paying you? <laughs> they volunteer, Allison? Um, yeah. Well, there's stipends for our meetings, but there's an awful lot that goes in beyond uh, those meetings for time. And uh, the yeah. stipends are mere $50 with mileage reimbursement. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. So you put in a lot of extra time. We really appreciate all of that. And um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart anyway. Uh, Bobby, did you want to say a few words? Well, just at the moral of your story on getting us started, uh, you go back to the old saying that, you know, you should never watch uh, sausage being made. Um, and, uh, you know, it takes a, a lot of work on our part uh, to get, get the necessary votes uh, to get things passed. But... Uh, it sometimes takes late hour meetings to achieve that. Um, the only thing uh, uh, besides Chris and I that have asked a few questions, uh, we also have Corey Parent, Senator Parent from Franklin County, uh, Brian Collimore from Rutland County, and of course, Anthony Polina uh, from Washington County uh, that serve on the Senate Ag Committee. And it's always easier to get a smaller crew to agree than it is a great big crew. And uh, we work, uh, we all work very well together. And uh, it, uh, it's certainly been great uh, for us to be here with you folks this morning, uh, listening uh, to all the positive, very positive uh, outcomes of, of the Working Lands Program. So it's all I'd say is, I guess, keep up the good work you're all doing. Uh, we'll keep up trying to get you enough money to make it uh, worthwhile. And, uh, and together, uh, you know, we should have a positive outcome. So thanks a lot to, to all of you. And thank you, Bobby. Um, it was interesting that night, um, all those years ago, 11 years ago or so, when every member of my committee was sitting around the room at five minutes to midnight, which I was just felt so supported by and couldn't quite believe. But today, some of the folks who haven't asked questions but are here on my committee, thank you, Bobby, for introducing yours. Uh, Rodney Graham is our vice chair. Um, and we have Terry Norris from Shoreham. Heather Supernot, Tom asked some questions. He's our ranking member. Vicki asked questions. And we have Henry Pearl here, who is a, a young dairy farmer from Cabot. And hit, it's his, no, you're from Danville. Yeah. And it's his birthday today. So happy <laughs> birthday. We're going to have a cake later. Any of you in the building, come on in. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you all again for um, working so hard and um, being a part of this process. We can't thank you enough. And with that, I think I'm just gonna, what, who? John O'Brien. Oh, John O'Brien, sorry. Well, he asked questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's true. Anyway, we're gonna take about a 15 minute break for those out, you, out there in YouTube land.